All right. Hello, Xavier. Welcome to the podcast. How you doing today? I'm doing well. How's it going? Amazing. This is exciting stuff. And yeah, real, real quick before we dive into everything, for those who have yet to meet you and discover all the wonderful work that you do and your podcast, let everybody know who you are, your background, where they can find you and all that. Sure, sure. So I'm uh, Xavier Bonilla. Um, I am my day job. Uh, I do clinical psych. I'm a clinician. I have been for, uh, oh goodness, probably over 15 years now. I have my doctorate in clinical psych. Um, I have a couple of master's degrees in psych and counseling. So I've been doing that work for a long time. Um, and if you, I don't really have a specialty. I guess if you had to pick a specialty or pin a specialty on me, um, I've worked a long time for, with folks that have adults mostly with severe uh, mental illness. So mm -hmm. schizophrenia, spectrum, bipolar, um, depression, anxiety, stuff like that. But uh, some of the more serious um, uh, experiences of that. So I've done that work for a while. Um, and that's what I do now. I, I, I'm a clinician. I work in private practice. Um, that's my day job. My, I guess, night gig <laughs> is uh, I have my own podcast, uh, Converging Dialogues, uh, which I do uh, frequently. <laughs> um, uh, so I've been doing it over a year now. Uh, we've had a lot of great guests. And basically the podcast is trying to um, find ways in which people all over the spectrum uh, with, you know, different fields of study and disciplines and um, political interest and social interest and, you know, even having philosophy there, just a, kind of a wide range of things, but just trying to get people exposed to different ideas, mostly from people that are uh, specialists or they're, you know, researchers or they're philosophers or writers, etc. And yeah, just kind of a wide net. And so it's, uh, it's been going really well. I enjoy, I enjoy both, th both things for, for uh, different reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we, we actually kind of like cross paths because we have a lot of the same guests mm -hmm. on our podcast. Mm -hmm. We read a lot of the same books. Yeah. We read a lot of the same books, a lot of the same guests, which is, which is great. I mean, we've talked about it before, which is, it's cool when, you know, the same guests uh, will go on different podcasts and there's some people that go on a bunch of these at the you know, same time, mm -hmm. but um, it's cool because you'll see um, for the guest, a different side of them each time they're on someone else, you know, cause different questions, different personality. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's cool because you'll pull different things uh, from, from each guest. So that's, that's always, always nice to see. And, and uh, it's, it's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm a I'm a huge psychology nerd. Before we hopped on, I was telling you about my mom's background, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, in psychology, and that's like kind of where my interest came. But I'm just fascinated with uh, human behavior, and that's why I enjoy listening to your podcast. You know, a lot more than I do, and you take different angles and all that. But uh, before we dive into some of the topics and everything, I'm curious because like I I love knowing like what makes people curious or interest. Like, what drew you to psychology? When were you sitting there and you were just like, you know what, this is, this is the thing I want to, I want to go and like, and, and study for all these years and work in the field and all that. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say probably, um, liberal arts and humanities was probably always my field, uh, or kind of, kind of that universe. Um, I was, I mean, I think I've said it before. I was raised, you know, fundamentalist Christian for a good part of my life. Um, I am not now, I haven't been for much of my adult life. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I was pretty rooted in theology for a long, long time, kind of a reformed, uh, tradition and rigorous study there. So, you know, theology starts to have a lot of crossing over with philosophy mm -hmm. and from a really early age when I was an adolescent, I was a big nerd when I was a kid, uh, as, as much as I read now, I've pretty much been reading that way my entire life, just different, yeah. different content. So, um, uh, yeah. So when I was younger, uh, you know, philosophy was my thing, you know, I would do theology and I would also, you know, read a lot of philosophy and I got really interested in epistemology. I really Ooh. liked, you know, how do we know things and how do we know how we know things? And that was really fascinating to me. And, you know, that eventually led to human behavior. And that led to 
uh, brain behavior relations, and that led to psychology. And, you know, psychology and philosophy definitely have a lot of yeah. crossover for sure. And so, you know, I wanted to, do, I was going to do philosophy. I mean, like proper, um, you know, and then I, there's a big part of me that's very pragmatic. I mean, some people know that about me as well. So mm-hmm. um, I said, you know what, I, doing philosophy proper, I don't just want to like write and teach and do research. So I said, you know, I, I kind of do something practical, you know, something I can make a living off of and yeah. do well. I mean, um, I wasn't that, I think, committed. Like I know some of my philosophy friends are, um, and they're just much smarter than me anyways with that stuff. So, um, so I said, you know, psychology is, is, uh, pretty pragmatic. Uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, practical and rooted in things and you get to deal with kind of people one-on-one and, you know, or you can deal with people one-on-one in different mm-hmm. ways and you get to understand things. And so, it just kind of went from there and then uh yeah you know got the bachelor's in psych and first master's in counseling second master's in clinical psych and then the doctorate so i just kind of you know i just kind of started probably somewhere after my right when i was finishing up my first master's i said you know i just i want to do clinical psych like i'm just mm-hmm. going to be like i'm just going to go all in and so i i took the uh the long path. And so I spent many years in school and many, many hour clinical hours and lots of, you know, training and uh, field placements and internships. And so that's kind of been my world. And I, I do love it. I, I really, really enjoy it. But they're, I, it's weird because people will see one side of me mm-hmm. and that's a lot of time and energy and effort and dedication. And, um, you know, but that's, you know, one love that I have, I have many loves and uh, philosophy is one of them. Um, I love biology and evolution is another one. Um, Many, many things. So I, uh, yeah, I, I, I I got into psychology and what I do with philosophy and and now I I do more philosophy now when I teach and it comes on the podcast and I've been reading that stuff for, you know, probably since I was a teenager. So all of it kind of bookends and morphs together, but that's kind of the short abbreviated version, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. No, psych- psychology was the thing that I always like to just read about and learn about and everything. And I only recently got into philosophy and, you know, one of the reasons I, you know, was interested in psychology was just my own battles with my, you know, depression and anxiety and all these other things. Right. And then I started reading philosophy and I, I enjoyed how it got my wheels turning. Right. And you talk about, epistemology and asking like how do we know what we know and i'm a huge fan of like cognitive behavioral therapy i just finished uh albert ellis's book again on uh Mm -hmm. rational emotive behavioral therapy Mm -hmm. and just questioning my own thoughts and how i know what my brain's telling me Mm -hmm. has helped me tremendously with my mental health so for me and what i try to explain to others like philosophy just kind of opening your mind and having you question the world and your own thoughts and experiences like it's helped me tremendously and maybe it can help others, you know? So I, I try to get people into it, but sometimes like for me personally, and maybe you can give me some advice on this. It's hard to find like philosophy books that I can like get into. Like I, you, you probably know I'm an audio listener, right? So I don't mm-hmm. read like the ancient books from like Kant or, you know, stuff like that. Right. But sometimes philosophers get way too profound and I'm just like, just stop mm-hmm. it. Right. Just, just stop. Mm-hmm. So I get kind of like, I don't even know if it's like pop philosophy, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, there's like uh, the Socrates Express, right? Great mm-hmm. book. Or mm-hmm. Nigel Warburton, I think yeah, that's his Nigel's name, great. right? Nigel's and he great. did that, yeah, he did that like little book on like, the, I'm like, hey, mm-hmm. I can get into this. So yeah, he's great. If, if people are listening and they're like me and enjoy philosophy, but they don't want to go insane and have to sit and like, I don't know, try to dissect every little word. Do you have mm-hmm. any book recommendations or philosopher recommendations that we could get into? Ah, uh, oh man. So, I mean, you know, I, as I've been reading philosophy and, and talking to different people, I mean, if you, I mean, I like kind of the, um, uh, existentialist phenomenologists. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I think there's something with the skeptics and, you know, Hume and Spinoza and Kant are all, they all have their place, but everyone really just has to at some point read Aristotle. I mean, all of the philosophers in the 20th century and the 19th century and the 18th century, you know, they were all just kind of doing his homework. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Aristotle is is kind of the man. Um, so he's, you know, he's uh, during the uh, Greek philosophical period. I don't find it difficult to read. Um, mm. It's usually pretty, it's thoughtful. I mean, he kind of has a, you know, 
writes in aphorisms. Um, so this is kind of very like, if you think of just like big paragraphs that you can kind of just digest. Um, I mean, they're all structured, but you know, uh, Nietzsche writes the same way and, and kind of mm -hmm. uh, with aphorisms. So I would say if you want to do, I think reading original source material is really important. Uh, obviously cliff notes or people that have commentary that condense it is important, but I think it is good for people to, to read the original source material. I would say Aristotle is, is pretty out of most people. He's pretty, um, I think digestible. Um, yeah. it's definitely something you want to take your time with. It's not something you're going to, you know, it's not a Dan Brown novel, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta sit with it and contemplate it and, but um, I'd say Aristotle is probably a good, a good place. I mean, his ethics is pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I would say is, I would say Aristotle is a, is a nice starting point. Um, and mostly because everybody kind of, in terms of philosophy, everyone kind of references him. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of kind of getting it straight from the source. Is he the one who was the student of Socrates or something like that, or am I thinking of someone else? No, well, they're all kind of connected in that they're all around the same period. They're all talking mm -hmm. about each other. Um, so that Plato and Socrates are, are usually ah, connected. And, and, and yeah. sometimes people will, will say that they're the same person or it was Plato, did Plato really exist? This is, you know, some people say that. But Aristotle was very much uh, in the same time frame, roughly. So mm. they're all kind of doing the same thing. So some, a lot of people like the Stoics, you know, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Seneca, um, you know, those, those, those guys are great. Um, I mean, I, I, I love Heraclitus, but I mean, he's, he's, uh, we just have his fragments and that stuff can kind of get, it's, it's deep in a, in a weird way. So I would say Aristotle. I mean, I think Aristotle's a, a good point for people that want to yeah. kind of get into it. And then of course you can have, uh, certain, um, Certain folks that kind of do some commentary. Nigel's great at that stuff. Uh, mm. I, I'd say Simon Critchley is pretty good at this stuff too. Simon's pretty pretty awesome at this, trying to make it tangible and practical. Um, there's a few other people that will come to my mind. I can't think of at the moment, but there's some people that try and make it kind of digestible. So, yeah, yeah, some of those boys. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll I'll eventually get around to it and try to sit with it because that is not something I think I could do audio format. Like I'll have to sit in a chair, like a, like a human being and kind of digest it a little bit. I, I, yeah. I mean, the Greeks really did the kind of oral format. Hmm, so th that stuff is, so it's, you know, like if you read Homer's the Iliad or the Odyssey, I mean, it was oral tradition. So people were talking this out loud. I mean, the, the Greeks somewhat are kind of like that too. Um, huh. So it wouldn't be terrible. Uh, I guess you need someone, uh, a good voice, uh, 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 actor or whatever to read it, to make it really compelling or something. But, um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't read, you know, Emmanuel Kant or John Locke or Martin Heidegger, uh, on audiobook. I probably wouldn't do that. That, that would be a, a real, you know, tough move there, but uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've tried to get away there. Or and it, it hasn't worked, but you know, as, as you mentioned it too, like the markets really does, that was actually, so that'll be a good place to start. So that was actually my introduction into philosophy. Like when I was going through a really rough time mentally in 2019, when the internet was coming after me for my YouTube channel and all that shit, I got into Ryan holiday. Right. And he's huge into the stoic stuff. And I started learning about how people are like, Oh, stoicism is like this bro philosophy. And like, you know, pull yourself on, up on the, bootstraps and everything and we're going to dive into some like political conversations in a second mm -hmm. but that's where i see people having issues with stoicism right is it seems like this very like right-leaning type of philosophy right like oh the world is fine it's just how you perceive the world you mm -hmm. know what i mean and for me stuff like that like uh when i was reading ryan holiday's stuff and learning about marcus aurelius and the stoics and all that it really helped get me through a tough time because mm -hmm. i realized like hey like i i can perceive this however i want you know i can find some inner strength and all that but now that you know i'm leveled out and everything and look at these systemic issues and all these things uh i can understand some of the criticism so i'm curious your thoughts on like stoicism in the modern day when there are these like social issues that you talk about on your podcast with different guests whether mm -hmm. it's uh you know issues with uh marginalized groups or whatever it is like do you mm -hmm. think stoicism is not the right route because of all the individualism with it well i think it you know you got to put this stuff into context i mean the stoics were writing at a period that was 
obviously much different than ours, but I think what's not different is the human experience. You know, mm -hmm. humans are kind of the same throughout time and then also they're not. So yeah, I mean, it can be kind of like a, you know, like a bro philosophy of sorts. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, sure. I can, uh, you know, maybe currently some, you know, right leaning folks use it to, to pursue some type of, you know, agenda, you know, whatever. But I think that that's not completely fair to the intention of what mm. those guys are trying to do. I mean, most people uh, can take anything out of, you know, to make it mean what they want. I mean, people were saying this with um, uh, some of the nationalism stuff from um, Fichte and some of the some of the stuff from Hegel and then definitely Nietzsche. And a lot of the German idealists were you know, the Nazis used to try and say like, oh, Ooh. see, like, you know, these guys had, you know, we're figured it all out and we're going to use their philosophy. And it's like, you know, they had no idea that wasn't their intention to, to have this, you know, propaganda for this particular party and so on and so forth. I mean, you can say this with Napoleon. He had certain folks that he was, you know, he, look, he used this philosophy to promote his, like, you know, because someone uses it in a particular way, um, you know, I, it doesn't mean that's how it was intended. And, and I do think, um, that uh, we do need to be close to the author's intent. And I think that the individualism of stoicism was, look, life's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, we all suffer and we all suffer in different ways. Um, and how do we live an active life of how do we do something about it? And, you know, for some people that's going to resonate. Some people, they're not going to be in the, the right space to hear that. And that's fine. Yeah. Um, and then they will. So maybe like, you know, for, for yourself, you know, like, you know, it, it kind of hits you at the right moment, a certain part mm -hmm. of your time in your life. And that's great. I mean, I think that it has a lot of, uh, a lot of utility there. So I think it's, you know, people can take anything and make it, you know, for their agenda. But I think if we're trying to get as close as we can to the, you know, the author's intent and what they were trying to say, um, I think that, uh, that that's most important. And sometimes this has a wide ranging uh, application. Um, part of my, distaste for a lot of the postmodern philosophers and postmodernism in general is that it takes a, uh, there's some utility to it, but there, it takes too much of a, um, everything's interpretive and it's like, uh, mm -hmm. not, not really <laughs> some things, um, or we're going to just deconstruct everything into bits and pieces. And it's like, yeah, there's a space for that, but I don't think it's, you know, the be all end all. So I do yeah. think we need to look at, uh, what was the kind of the close intent? What was the, the context um, you know, of some of these things and you can apply it in different ways, but I think you have to just be, you know, kind of honorable to what the person was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's, you know, even now that I, like I'm, I'm remembering like where it all started and I, I got into like Buddhist philosophy even sure. before that, because, uh, yeah. you know, I was a few years sober and I discovered mindfulness and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it helped because I was struggling in my sobriety and I learned about mindfulness and like, I was like, oh shit, like this is helping. Like, uh, you know, it's not an experience many people have, but one of the first times I did a mindfulness meditation, like I was like, like, it was like this aha moment. I'm like, oh damn, mm -hmm. I don't have to fight against these emotions, these feelings, these thoughts and all these other things. But anyways, and I'm like, okay, so where did this start and everything? And, uh, you know, Buddhist philosophy, they talk about suffering too. Like suffering is this inevitable part of life. And I have an upcoming episode with a guest on your podcast as well, Paul Bloom. And we were yeah. talking yeah. about, you know, his new book and suffering. And I'm curious your thought too, when we see some of these like, social uh justice debates and everything because i you know before we dive into the centrist conversation like i feel like i'm pretty progressive and i want systems to get changed to get fixed and all this other stuff but i'm a firm believer like suffering is going to happen and something i talk with paul bloom about is like it feels like there's certain segments of people who uh many would label as woke right where we're talking about like trigger warnings and safe spaces and all these other things where it feels like their expectation is that they're like there's this end goal where life is no longer going to have suffering right everybody around them is going to always say the right things never offend them nothing ever is going to go wrong and and that's where i'm like that is unrealistic like i can i can tell someone like hey i think you're being a dick right now right mm -hmm. but i can't have an expectation that we're ever going to reach a place where nobody ever makes me uncomfortable again you know what i mean mm -hmm. so 
what are your thoughts in that regard? Do you, do you feel like some people have an expectation of no more suffering or discomfort? You know, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, what some, some people think or what their expectation is. Uh, some people might think that, um, I think it's hard to get a really honest answer out of some of the most, uh, um, you know, very, 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 very extreme left progressive folks. Um, you know, they might say that, you know, utopia is the ideal or something. I don't know to, to, to eradicate suffering on the planet or I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what their ultimate end would be. I don't expect an honest answer. So, yeah. um, and that's not, I'm not saying that they would be lying. I just think it would be like, you know, there's a certain element where it's like, okay, like, you know, wh where do we, where do we not need any more progressing? Right. I mean, when, when do we get some wins here? When do we get some W's mm -hmm. under our belt? And it feels like when we do point out that there are some wins, it's not enough. We didn't dream big enough. We didn't go big enough. We didn't go, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, but I mean, everything is, is in progress, right? You're, you're not going to, you're not going to get to the end of it. So I think that there's, there's some aspirational um, utility for that. You know, we, we should try to end, um, stuff, you know, we should find cures for cancer and, and, and Alzheimer's and, you know, everyone on the planet should have clean water. And I mean, those things are um, aspirational and things we're actively working to, uh -huh. you know, eradicate or, or, res or resolve. And we should keep working on that. But, you know, the, at the end of the day, um, you know, suffering is a part of life. It always has been. Um, it, suffering doesn't know any any morals or values. It just is, um, and it's uh, it's difficult. Um, and I think the sooner we accept that that's a part of life, because to me, suffering is a, is an aspect of life that tells you that it's real. Mm. This isn't an illusion, right? Yeah. This is this is real. We're rooted in in something in, that's a that's reality based. And most of the time it sucks um, and we don't like it, but uh, I think we can find, I think we, people can, can find kind of this relative uh, meaning out of it. Um, maybe not for everything, but I think for a lot of things. Uh, I also talked to, to Paul on, on the podcast and we had a little bit of disagreement on this. Um, you know, his belief is that some, some events, just suck. Some suffering is just, just shit. It's terrible. There's, there's no silver lining. And, and I get his point and I think he's right on one level. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that there is potential value from every experience if we can find it. And the value mm -hmm. is not an absolute value. It's a value that we impose for our own specific experience in our lives with our you know folks around us. Um, it doesn't mean you have to do that necessarily with every single thing, but, and it might not happen in that moment, but it might 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. And I think he was agnostic about it, but I think he was like, yeah, I could see that. Sure. Um, so it's a, it was, we had a, we had a really nice exchange on that. So yeah, I think on the suffering piece, I think that we shouldn't be, um, beside ourselves to say, well, that's just going to happen and we shouldn't do anything about it. I'm not saying that, yeah. but I definitely don't think it, it's a, it's an all or nothing, right? Until we get to the final aim, um, none of it's good. And it, mm -hmm. it becomes this kind of black and white thinking with, with some progressives and not all, but some. And I don't think that that's A, grounded in reality and B, uh, I don't think that it promotes a kind of liberal pluralism that we should be promoting, uh, uh, you know, here in the United States or really anywhere is mm -hmm. look, if you're, you know, truly about liberalism, you're okay with people having different ideas and different beliefs we don't have this uniformity. Um, and the fact that everyone doesn't pony up and get on board and, and believes exactly the way you do, you know, that's not liberalism by definition. Yeah. And so I think that there starts to become a kind of breakdown, but you know, I, so we could get into specific details, but I, that's my, my broad answer to that question.
yeah yeah no very very well said and and yeah uh i i remember uh in my conversation with paul too we talked a little bit about that and you know something that you know uh was another like enlightening experience for me was when i got into 12-step programs and we read like the big book and there's a section of the promises and they say you know we we do not forget the past nor wish to shut the door on it right and you know it was basically teaching me like hey man you got through this shit you're a little bit stronger. And then it talks about how our experience can help others and everything. But like you said, like, uh, you know, I'm of that belief too, where even if not in that moment or even not for a month, a year, whatever it is, I can look back and say, I survived that and I'm a little bit stronger, right? It helps me move through the day. Like in 2019, when all that shit happened, the one of the things that was my saving grace aside from a support group and therapy and all that stuff was like, hey, hey, Chris, in 2012, you had a 10% chance of living and you were a drug addict and you made it through that, right? So you can get through this. And that's where I, I find strength in my suffering, even though it might take me a long, long time to look back. And, and like you said, like suffering reminds us that this is, this is life and we're grounded in a real experience. Yeah, that, that really happened to you. That, that wasn't a, a, an illusion. That wasn't yeah. a hallucination. That really happened. Mm -hmm. And that, that is rooting you in something that, you know, I mean, that, that's telling you an aspect of that you can't avoid or ignore it. And it's saying that there's something to be said about you existing, your being of who you are as, a, as an individual existing on the planet there. It's saying something uh, about being itself, right? Who you are as an individual is saying, yeah, this really happened. It, that's much harder to do with positive uh, experiences. Mm. Um, it's they're wonderful when they happen, and we should crystallize them in our memories. But um, they're much easier to kind of uh, dismiss. No, oh, you know that was that could have just been because of this, or ah, you know that wasn't really that good as much as I remembered it to be. Or, but mm. our suffering is like no, that was awful. That was terrible, and you know I I'm. I hated it at the moment, but many times it does make us uh, stronger, I would say. And and the fact that we want to be stronger as opposed to weaker, right? You, you said it, I've said it, other people have said it. Well, you know, it made me stronger. People say that. Yeah, we don't we don't aim for weakness, right? Mm -hmm. You could you could swap out strength for vitality, right? Mm -hmm. you, something where you're having this active participatory way of engaging in the world and with other organisms, people, things, animals, uh, in a very active way, that's vitality. That's, you know, strength. That's something we should be shooting for. Um, and you're not going to get that if you feel, you know, weak or if you're not having experiences with, uh, in reality. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, like, with with some of that and you know i want to go back to a little bit of like the liberalism and everything too and dive into one of the main reasons i wanted to have you on because like i i can see like when i when i listen to your podcast and i listen to others like i can see like how a person's personality kind of makes them look at the world like for example with what in reference to what we're talking about right with that strength and the suffering and the experience like my experience like the experience i've had in life when I see like the kind of culture wars and the bullshit that goes on, I'm like, is this really something that we're going to waste our time or our breath on, right? I, I put everything on a scale, you know what I mean? Because when, when you go through some like real suffering, you look at some of the stuff like, hey, this is like nothing, right? This is nothing compared to, you know, my thing is, like, I know we all have our things, like some people, it's like racial stuff or the trans stuff or like feminism. And like, for me, it's like mental health and addiction. I look at, you know, overdose rates, suicide rates, addiction, all these other things. That's my thing, right? So when I see like these debates about like the stuff in schools, which we'll talk about in a little bit, like, I'm like, you guys, Let's let's try to make sure that kids don't start shooting up heroin when they're 15. Let's do that, and then we'll, we'll go from there. But anyways, uh, brought you on because you identify as a centrist, and this is where I I want to ask you questions, and I need you to help me out too. So okay, I'm gonna I'll, break I'll do my this. Best. <laughs> I'm gonna break this down for you. I'm gonna tell you how I think what I think a centrist is, yeah. and it might be rooted in some stigma 
too, right? And I'm sure you're well aware of this, <laughs> sure, right? Sure. So I, I mentioned to you at the time of recording this, uh, I just recorded with Embrace the Void the other day and he wanted to bring me on. And he he warned me like, hey, I'm going to ask you and kind of press you a little bit because some people might see you as like a fencer or a flip flopper, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I, I feel like is centrist, right? Like, hey, I don't want to pick, I'm, hey, I'm just Switzerland. That's me. I'm a pacifist. I don't have any strong beliefs. And <laughs> right, you sent me right. a, a phenomenal piece that you wrote uh, on radical centrism. But that's my concern. Like, I feel, so I feel like that I look at every situation independently, right? I don't like, oh, my side believes in this, my side believes in that. I look at every situation independently, do my research, form an opinion, go from there. You know what I mean? That's how I feel. But some of them, uh, or you know, a lot of people, with especially with the polarization now, it feels like if you try to take a rational point of view on anything, they call you a fence sitting. Just you, you didn't, you didn't pick the right side. And you're, if you're not with us, you're against us. And mm -hmm. you know, we've talked to a lot of same people who probably have been uh, accused of these things. Mm -hmm. And you know, like some of the same people will get accused of being like a MAGA Trump supporter, and others. And, and that same exact person by somebody else would be accused of being like a, a socialist, communist, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. So anyways, those are my thoughts. Those are, that's my experience. And I'm sure you have a better definition or view of centrism, right? Like, mm -hmm. is, it, is, it, is it on policy or is it on social issues? Is it on everything? Lay it on me. Well, I think that centrism is uh, you know you ask you know 10 different people you get 10 different answers for me <clears throat> um you know i think it, it kind of comes down you can break it into uh two forms uh, so i think you can have a, a a temperament of centrism and then you can have kind of the issues of centrism uh, and i think you can have both to be a centrist doesn't mean you're you know, riding the fence, middle of the road, compromise all the time, 50-50, um, you know, uh, both sides in it, uh, mm. all of these other things. It is very funny, though. I'll just say this as a, as a footnote. It's funny trying to see people kind of, uh, <laughs> whatever word you want to use, attack, bully, make fun of centrist. It's a very funny thing to see uh, online mm -hmm. um, because there's not really any good, like, put downs for centrists yeah <laughs> they're all kind of lame and it's less like oh yeah you're just trying to like both sides it's like yeah sometimes like is that the best you got like oh you're not really committed it's just like i mean no but okay if yeah. that's what you think i mean i don't know there's not really good like i don't know i guess put down it's, it's always funny to see people try and, and tear down centrism i would say you know in the temper look i think some people would say that we need to be able to talk to to everybody, right? There's this kind of attitude of this kind of openness to like, let's talk to, you know, Republicans and Democrats and, and independents and everyone in between, libertarians and, and um, whatever your party is or affiliation is or whatever, um, you know, whichever country you're in. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, these terms are start to look different in Europe and, and other places. But um, but then I think that there is a type of centrism, which is on policy issues, which means that put it this way. So if uh, if the Democratic Party in the United States or the Republican Party is the two major parties in the U.S., they have a platform, right? You know, that is a literally the parties, you know, the RNC and the DNC. They this is what the codified Ten Commandments are, if you will, the gospel truth for their party of what they believe, right? And I mean they are kind of like articles of faith, if you will. I mean, there there's not a lot of flexibility there, right? Cool. A little bit, but not a lot. And I think some of that's okay. I definitely think there are some things that make one person uh, prone to one side or the other. So, um, you know, if someone is, if you want to say center left or center right or whatever, you know, or if you just want to say on, on the left or on the right, you know, there's not going to be many 
liberals that are going to be really animated about limited government. I mean, you just, that's antithetical to what liberals are for. Yeah. Like you just can't, like, that's just not a part of it. Um, it's the same thing with um, Republicans, right? I mean, they're going to be for, you know, limited government, small governments, you know, stronger states' rights, um, many, many things. Okay. There are some ideological pieces here that just, it's, a, it's an outlook on how you see the world, right? Mm. This is how I think we should do things as a country, as, um, you know, different communities, Overall, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want the government taking all of my, or much of my taxes, you know, or my money to taxes to, to give it to other programs and stuff like that. I want to decide what I want to do with it. That's a, that's a worldview. That's an outlook, right? That's a mm -hmm. conservative kind of in its true sense, I guess. Um, liberals in kind of a political sense are more, um, no, I mean, when, when everyone does well, we all do well and we need to have these things to promote, you know. Uh, services we use, you know, together in society. And, you know, it's kind of this, you know, social contract idea, et cetera, et cetera. So th there's a kind of worldview there, which is fine, right? That's fine. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Centrism is not that I don't have strong beliefs about something or not that you don't feel very passionately about something. I mean, centrists feel very passionate about things. Like, give me an example. <clears throat> I'll give you an example, but here, here's, here's one thing about that. The difference is the centrists aren't going to be beholden to um, all or a majority of a party's platform. So they could share a worldview or an outlook, mm. but that might translate differently based on the issue in front of them because you want to look at what the nuance is at that mm. moment for that particular context. Now, if I just say, no, I'm a Democrat. This is what it is. This is what I have to be for. That's it. Mm -hmm. I think what that does is that puts blinders on people from really thinking about the issue. And, you know, there's, you know, some work that's been done on, you know, for a while was, you know, an us versus them kind of thing was, was in this country very much a, well, this is my team. This is my tribe. So I'm going to coalesce with them and I'm going to be with them. And I don't really care what you guys do, but this is my team. This way. Now it's, no, this is my team. And now being part of this team means I have to vehemently be against your team. Right. Mm -hmm. And that becomes more polarized, which is, which is very damaging. So as an example, you know, you could be for, um, universal healthcare, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, public option or, or just, just flat out universal healthcare. Everyone gets it. We all buy into it. We all have to have something, the end. And it should be free and we shouldn't have to worry about it. But you could also say, yeah, but I live in Idaho and I think that, you know, Second Amendment, I want to have my guns. It's a right mm -hmm. and I want to use it. Now, you can't do that really if you're just kind of following the party line for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to say, yeah, I believe in climate change, but I'm not too sure how much of man's involvement is, is there. And I definitely don't want, you know, cap and trade. I'd rather just have nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. you, you can't say that if you're a liberal, like you have, I mean, you can, but it's going to be, people are going to start questioning your, you know, allegiance, right? And yeah. you, look, you can do this on the right, you know, well, you know. I mean, I think a woman can choose what she wants to do with her body. Are you kidding me? That's mm -hmm. killing a baby. No, I don't know if we can have you in our club. You know, mm -hmm. or if you're like, yeah, you know, um, I kind of like how my public school is. What? We cannot have. We don't even need Department of Education. That's only been around since the 70s. Mm -hmm. So it's stuff like that. It's you have to kind of, and, and and look, there are some things that I think are staples of kind of each side. That's kind of what I was talking about, like limited government, big government. It's the involvement of it and how mm -hmm. people are using some of that. That is kind of a, a worldview kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but, but then I think that, you know, the world is very complicated and we must 
you know, take things on the issues and, and on its merits. So I can tell you specifically how I think about it, but you, you go ahead and jump in if there's, if there's anything I'm, uh, well, I'm I, here's, here's what I'm wondering. Like, I, I don't know if you follow them or anything like that, but, uh, so I, I, I watched like independent news, right? So like, uh, crystal and Sager, uh, yep. if you're one, yeah. So yep. breaking points, uh, and then there's Kyle Kalinske, secular talk, um, the humanist report, Mike and stuff like that. And I, so, <clears throat> You know, uh, when you get someone like, uh, you know, like Mike from Humanist Report, he, he's like very like progressive and stuff like that. Then you have, but when I look at someone like Kyle and Crystal, for example, yeah, like there is a growing movement of people who aren't walking that party line and they're looking at the Democrats, right? And they call them corporate Democrats because it seems like they're doing everything in the interest of these like billionaires, millionaires and all this other stuff. And they're not walking that party line. But I don't think, I don't think any of them would identify as a centrist. So do you see what I mean? Like, it seems like, like, for example, I'll, I'll watch, you know, Kyle and he's, uh, he was part of like the Democratic Socialists of America and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, he believes in like, you know, the, the Scandinavian type model and all that. And he's like, hey, own your guns. I want common sense gun laws, you know? And he, you know, some of these, so there's, there's, there's some people who would identify very left leaning, but they want a nuanced conversation. But I'm curious, like your thoughts, like, would you, do you see those people as more like center because they're not like, hey, this is what my team believes, even though I'm, or is that more of like when we get into the conversation of left of center, right of center, where it's just yeah. not so far to the yeah. extremes? I think that there's, you know, look, I mean, look, people can do what they want. I want people to, I'm fine if people want to identify as Democrat and Republican. It doesn't bother me. It, it, yeah. it, that's, and see, that's the difference, right? Yeah. Like, I don't, you don't need to be in the middle with me. That's fine. Like, I just, but I just don't want it to be this, you know, contentious hostility where we're you know politics has a really good way and i mean good at meaning effective i guess in a in a bad way of dehumanizing people you know and it's like look that's still a person like i don't care if that person i mean i yeah. do and so, to a certain extent i don't care if that person voted for trump or they voted for someone else like i, I don't care mm -hmm. I, I, I mean we can have disagreements right i, I mean i've said publicly i, I vehemently dislike uh, uh president trump um mm -hmm. for many reasons um I, I i can get into those if you want I, I think people dislike him for different reasons and i have my own reasons which i personally think are good ones right it's mm -hmm. not all of the stuff that most people talk about i have different reasons for not liking him um but i don't for people that that you know the 80 million people that voted for him it's 80 million people yeah i, I wanted so each one of those people or not each one, but many of those people has a family. They they have their own struggles. They have things that are bothering them. They feel like people aren't listening to them. You know, mm -hmm. my my first inclination isn't to ostracize that person. My first thing is to run to that person and say, hey, what was it that this fucking guy said yeah. that you're you're gonna pull the pull the lever for him? Where did it fail you? And if yeah. it's like well, here's all the reasons. That's what I want to hear. I don't want to be like, oh, God, this is, you know, a racist bigot and I can't ever interact with them. Yeah. That's absurd. That's absurd yeah. to me. And on the left, the same. It's like I, I, I'm, I don't like the far left um, just as much as I don't like the far right. But I still want to understand from that side. Okay, <laughs> you guys are saying a whole lot of stuff. You're making a lot of righteous claims. Why? Yeah. Like maybe people are just complicated. Maybe it isn't, you know, we, we can't get it to this singularity where it's just, you know, box A or box B and that's it. Yeah. But why are you doing that? Like, I want to know that. I think that kind of openness and curiosity and trying to explore that, it becomes very difficult when you're uh, wrapped up in your tribe's platform and it's like, nope. Here's all the ticket lines. I vote blue. I vote red. Down the down the ballot. Don't even think about it. That's what we do. And the end. And they're the bad guy and we're the good guy. Like it just, yeah. that is what I don't like. And I think that's what a lot of party politics does. And I definitely think that's what ideology does. And that's, that's why I don't play that. Because it just makes me miss the human 
uh, and makes me miss the person. And that's what's more important to me. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we will we will dive into the Trump conversation because I think you're the perfect person to talk uh, to about this. But, uh, you know, as you talk, I'm like, this, this is why we get along, Xavier, because, you know, I'm the same way. Like, I... I have been like a political nihilist my whole life. I'm like, who cares if you vote? I'm one of like hundreds of millions of people. My vote doesn't do anything. But in 2016, that's when I had that moment, like you're talk, uh, like what you're talking about, your the way you see the world. Where when when Trump was elected in 2016, I'm like, I need to figure out what the fuck's going on. Right? <laughs> like there is a reason. Like there is a reason people voted for him like something is terribly wrong and as i've caught up and as i've been you know reading all these books and understanding and all this stuff you know like i uh you know uh, my son was born new year's eve 2008 right in the heart of the recession in Mm -hmm. february in february i was laid off i actually wrote about this in a substack piece today like i was laid off in february my son was two months old i was laid off after all of us employees agreed to take a pay cut. So no more layoffs would happen. So got laid mm-hmm. off. Right. And the owner of that car dealership, he had houses all over the country. He had a house in Italy, right? He flies private jets, all sorts of shit. And then mm-hmm. there was all these corporate bailouts. So as I started to understand, like in 2016, why, you know, we didn't just, everybody didn't just flock to Hillary. And it was a little bit more nuanced mm-hmm. than everybody's just a sexist or a white supremacist or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, that's when I was like, okay, well, what's going on? What, how do these people feel? But here's, Here's what I want to talk to you about, because since you're into philosophy too, here's where I struggle. And I've talked with, you know, some political philosophers about this. So I get it. Like, I totally get it. Like, I think it's ridiculous to be like, oh, you voted for so-and-so. We can't talk. We can't be friends. Right. Right. But when it comes down to personal morals and values, that's, that's where I start to have an issue. Right. And maybe you, since you think similarly, you're seeing something that I don't, you're giving people more of a benefit of the doubt, right? But for example, right, I, I don't see how I can befriend someone and want to hang out with them if they are believing that the election was stolen, which helped lead to January 6th and stuff like that, right? Or I can go down the laundry list of Trump's things, right? Like, uh, you know, the 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 false claims that he made, the fueling of polarization and anger and animosity. So my thing is like on a moral level, like even if you want small government and everything like that, like how can you still back such just a terrible person? You know what I mean? Like for me, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit more than just being like, oh well, I'm gonna let all of these other terrible things slide. Like it's all still up in the air with like sexual assault allegations and his ties to Epstein. Like so, I'm not even taking that into consideration. But him as a person, I'm like, this man is morally just fucking terrible. So if you back him, how do I like? I, you're not somebody I would like hang out with because it seems like you would hang out with liars and assholes. You know what, I, does that kind of make sense like on a moral level? So I really get, I almost get offended when they're like, oh, so you just don't want to hang out with me because I like Trump? No, 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 no. It goes deeper than that, you mm-hmm. know? So, so on a moral level, maybe you can talk me through how you kind of view that situation. <laughs> so I don't see a moral level. Um, yeah. I'm not looking at politicians for morals and ethics. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe some ethics, but there should there should be some ethics, but definitely not morals. And I don't think it's I don't think it's entirely necessary. I think there should be some element of it, but not entirely. I mean, look, the first question, the first, I mean, I can I can give you so many counters to what you just said, and the reason I can give you so many counters. Mm-hmm. Is because I have friends that are Trump supporters. I really? hang out with these people. And really look, I hang out. Way. I have plenty of progressive friends too. I, I hang out with them. It doesn't. I don't see that stuff. I I just see you know we have fun you know conversations and spirited conversations. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, that's my friend. That's my family member. We're gonna get a beer, and I don't care. You know, mm-hmm. th- I I don't care. I, it doesn't. I mean, I care to a certain extent, but it not enough to not you know, have a relationship with them. So, you know, the, 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 some of the counters will be, are you kidding me? You're you're telling, you're telling, you're telling me about politicians lying and being immoral. Are you kidding me? Look at, look at, I mean, 
the Clintons. Yeah. Look at Bush. Look at you know God, Nixon, LBJ. Just pick, take any of your pick. You can, we can just go down the list. Why? Because they were buttoned up. Because they you know hide hid behind their 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 affiliations. So what? You know, I have more respect for Donald Trump because he just says exactly he's not hiding anything. He's just saying, yeah, I said it. And people, I'm going to respect that. You know, you're the one that can't do it, right? You're the one that needs people to dress it up for you and put on a nice, you know, mask and whatever. Like, no, this guy's just telling it like it is. He's just being his real self. And I'm tired of politicians having to, you know, always try and pander to me and all this and this and this. Like, why not? We ha- why, why don't we have someone like that? That You're going to get some version of that. That that's the counter. That's the counter you're gonna yeah. get. Yeah. No, I I definitely hear you. Like right right after right after I was like, okay, cool. Biden got elected. Like, I think like the day after it was like official. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. I cracked my knuckles. I sat down and I wrote an essay. I voted for Joe Biden, but he sucks. Right. <laughs> just went through like all this shit. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and and this is what I hate just about the polarized politics. Like with uh, you know, just in the last couple of years, we had all the Kavanaugh stuff. And then the second like allegations come out against Biden, they're like, oh, oh, oh no, let's not talk about that. So like I, I see it on all the sides. So I definitely see what you're saying. But so so to your point about like, you know, we hang out and I have friends, right? So for example, I live in Las Vegas ton of mormons here my best friend's mormon his family like my mom was an alcoholic my dad worked a ton and you know he was doing his thing and my best friend's family like pretty much helped raise me they were like my second family and they're hella mormon hella conservative like you go over there watching tucker carlson and all this stuff and just super trump supporters so i get it i get it because i love i love them and they're kind compassionate people who cared for me most of my life, invited me over for holidays and stuff because I stopped hanging out with my mom, all that stuff. So I get that, but I'll, I'll use like a different situation and just a little thought experiment, if you will, right? So you have a friend, you have a friend who is, uh, you know, you guys are into the same like books, movies, music, you laugh, you have a good time, all these other things, right? Yeah. But on January 6th, they flew across the country, broke into the Capitol and stormed in there because the election was stolen, right? Like Mm -hmm. at a certain point, don't you look at that person and say like, you're not grounded in reality, right? Like- I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Okay, so so walk me through that thought process. I would want to understand why Mm -hmm. um, they believe that way. Now, I'll, I'll totally grant you that- whatever their media diet is, is probably fucking garbage, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's McDonald's really. I mean, most, mo- most of mainstream media is that way, but you know, yes, if, if they're eating the equivalent of ramen every night by watching Tucker or anything on Fox, or, you know, you can make the equivalent on the left of MSNBC or yeah. whatever, but um, you know, that's just not good for your brain in general. And, and it really is just kind of, point. you know, fine. Maybe they're not watching mainstream, but they're, you know, doing some, you know, derivative of, you know, basically quasi conspiratorial kinds of stuff online, you know, that's going to, it's going to warp your mind a little bit and, and you're going to see things that aren't really there that you want to be there to animate your feelings, to animate your emotional kind of outrage. My guy lost. Yeah. There's some things that are kind of odd. There's things that are odd every election. Um, you know, it was unique, the fact of all the mail-in ballots and all that stuff, granted, mm-hmm. during the pandemic. So, you know, okay. Um, I, I mean, I can, I, can, I can go all of that that way with the person. I, I'll mm-hmm. walk right with you on that. I mean, I don't believe that, but I, 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 can, I, can, I can hear the, the, the reasoning. You know, but when we get to Republican, you know, uh, state secretary saying okay look we verified this we've counted it like 18 times like it's fine like it's all there and they still don't believe that's where i'm like okay take the l let's just take the, take the l and just you know try again i mean we know democrats are going to fuck it up in 22 and 24 you'll be fine you'll get your chance again <laughs> like just just take the l for you know two three years you'll be fine yeah. uh, um so yeah but then i See, that's where it becomes difficult is 
you know, I, I, I found January 6th, you know, completely sobering, one of the lowest points for us as a country, um, you know, just an abomination. Just there's not enough adjectives to describe how despicable it was. And, and <laughs> I think that there's a handful of people there that really believe you can say it's delusional or not. That's fine. Mm -hmm. They really believe the election was stolen. They really believe they were righteous in what they did to try and protect it from not being stolen. And, and again, if, if this, if the shoe was on the other foot, you know, and we thought Donald Trump stole the election and was there wrongfully. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would all be saying authoritarian dictator, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you might've had other people doing the same thing because mm -hmm. they really believe it was stolen. Even if all the other things said otherwise, it can't be, it can't be. He was impeached twice. He did all of these things. He was behind in polls. There's no way. Maybe he, if he, if we all found out the data, the same data, the same procedures, this is why we need institutions, by the way, if we have all these things, well, we got to take that out like we did in 16. But I guarantee you, there would have been a sizable amount of people that would have been like enough, no way. And maybe some people on the far left would have done something similar. I, I, maybe not. I don't know. But I, even if that's not the case, I don't like what ifs, but I can understand some people having that mentality. Now, I don't think their actions <laughs> were justifiable in any way. I do not think any of that should have happened. But in terms of trying to understand the mentality, yeah, I, I, I could get it for some people. I, yeah. I, again, I 110% I disagree. It, but that's not the point. The point is to try and say, how do I try and sit there with this person not in a judgmental way, but to try and understand, hear them tell me their reasoning. Again, just listening, not trying to like condemn and judge and say that they're mm -hmm. you know fucking insane and and just say, you know what? I get it. I hear you. Mm -hmm. I can I can understand it. Yeah. Understanding is not the same as agreeing or being complicit or whatever. And again, for people that are listening, I do the same thing. I do the same thing with very, very, very progressive lefties, you know, the quote unquote woke. I, yeah. I get it. I get why these people are saying this. Yeah, I hear it. And, and so you, we have to we have to have uh, a stronger stomach for this stuff, because if we don't, people are just going to keep splintering. They're going to keep diverging and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. We have to try and just say like, look, this is hard for me. Let me push past that and let me just hear what my fellow human, my fellow person is thinking and believing and try to just understand this stuff and try and make some inroads. But, you yeah. know, if people aren't going to do that, then, you know, and, and I think that's very hard to do when you're ideologically possessed or you're just uh, under the banner of whichever team you're on. Yeah, yeah. And as you're talking, I'm just like, God damn it, Xavier, because you reminded me like with your background, it makes sense in your <laughs> clinical work. Because like just quick little story, right? Uh, you know, I worked at a drug and alcohol rehab center for a few years. And like, uh, you know, at an inpatient rehab, we had an inpatient and outpatient, right? I had people come up and cuss me out during detox and stuff like that. And all they just fucking, you like, you know this, right? Like when people are sick and, and I can forgive, I'm like, Hey man, like you're going through some shit. I totally understand. Right. And I, I had a family member who I was just Oh, I despise them. Right. And one day I just had this epiphany. I'm like, treat them like you would one of your clients and, you know, think of them as a sick person. Right. And it helped me start getting along with them. So anyways, what I'm, the, there's a long way of saying, like, if I look at these people as individuals and not a group and think about the media they've been consuming, their background, what, what they believe. Right. And this is one of the reasons why I think beliefs are so, you know, they're, they're part of, they're part of the human experience, but they're so dangerous because like when I see people storm the Capitol, I'm like, yeah, if you believe, if you believe this is true, mm -hmm. yeah. if you think this is happening, like, but you know, we look at somebody, uh, you know, the, the guy who went into Comet Pizza with uh, the gun, because mm -hmm. he believed, he believed that there was a basement where they were like 
sex trafficking children, right? And yeah. that's why beliefs can be so dangerous and why I, I, you know, advocate for people to be flexible on their beliefs. And I, I, I try to bring people on where we talk about their books about decision making and, you know, cognitive psych and all these other things. But anyways, here's where I'm screwed up. And I've, I have yet to find a good answer on this, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, you see it all the time on Twitter. And it's these people with large followings, loud voices, and there's no way, there's no way to tell when someone is just full of shit. Like we were talking about earlier, right? Like if I asked like a progressive or whoever, right? There's a certain point where I just don't know if they're lying to me, if they really think the way they think, right? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's a, there's a fact. There's a fact that people are pandering to a certain audience because of the way we incentivize, you know, how, how you can make money online, how you can mm -hmm. get attention. We all love our egos being fueled and stuff. Mm -hmm. And here's where I struggle. And I'll use a recent example, right? Uh, Dave Rubin. So Dave Rubin went on the Braver Angels podcast. I'm like, I'll mm -hmm. listen to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Sh I shout out, shout out to John Wood Jr. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. He's Did lovely. Did you listen to that episode? I have not listened to that okay. episode. I've listened to a few of them, um, but yeah. John John's so, a good friend. I, I love John. He's great. So I I fucking I love Braver and Angels. Uh, I read a uh, early copy of Monica's book that's yeah, coming she's, out. She's uh, fantastic. She's, she's lovely as well. She's yeah, great. she's awesome. I love what they're doing. I love their mission. Mm -hmm. But I listened to that episode, and maybe maybe we'll revisit after you check it out. But Dave Rubin, if I had to say somebody, even though I I don't I couldn't prove that he's full of shit, right? Mm -hmm. Like. I think that he's full of shit and he panders to an audience. He found an audience. He makes money off that audience and he'll say whatever it is. Another example, fuck it, I'll name drop. Tim Pool, right? I've watched that guy's transition. The famous one is Milo Yiannopoulos. Hell, we have Alex Jones. Alex mm -hmm. Jones is an ego-driven, money-hungry motherfucker, right? Mm -hmm. So now let's get back to the moral talk, okay? Mm -hmm. How... How can I like, cause I, I've had people from all over the political spectrum on my podcast. I don't give a shit, right? Mm -hmm. But how could I in good conscience have one of these guys come on when I think that they are full of shit, right? Like I was listening mm -hmm. to Dave Rubin talk with the wonderful, the wonderful John Wood, right? <laughs> the, about, about the polarization in media, right? And I'm looking at him, I'm like, you motherfucker. Right. I'm like, have you watched or listened to your content? See, I'm going on a rant now, but that's where I find an issue because uh, you can look at somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene, some of these people who fan the flames of the polarization. And I don't know how I'm supposed to be like, yeah, one day come on my podcast and let's have a calm, normal conversation because I think you're being deceptive on purpose for nefarious reasons. So mm -hmm. Lay, lay your thoughts on me about that because you're on Twitter. You see these people pander. And I, I do. I, 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 every day I see it. Um, so here, here's my, my general uh, statements. I, I think that for folks like this, I, I know who you're talking about. Uh, so the people you named and others. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a few things. So the first thing is, well, maybe I don't want to say the first thing uh, in no particular order. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of these folks are, um, they, they've, they've really been hurt um, by the system, by other people, um, and they've been hurt in different ways. They've been ridiculed. They've been mocked. They've been told their, you know, their ideas don't mean anything. They've been told, you know, we don't accept you here, uh, for for various different things. Whether it's their, you know, their gender or sexual orientation or their religion or you name it, their age, you know, <clears throat> their race, you know, so uh, their their ideas, their beliefs, and there's always somebody that's gonna accept you. Mm -hmm. And when you gain a following of people that accept you, you start to kind of parrot what they want to hear and the feedback you want to get from them. And it, um, it becomes a downward spiral and you kind of get stuck in quicksand, I think. Then you're, you're getting a lot of feedback 
positive feedback. People love you. You know, you're calling things out. Okay. And, and then you, it becomes a, a numbers game, you know, then, you know, Oh, if I start getting into this territory, I'm going to get more likes. I'm going to get more clicks. I'm going to get more of an audience. Uh, Now I'm getting monetized. Now I'm getting, you know, bigger, 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 bigger. And now I'm, you know, all of a sudden I'm talking about, you know, um, conspiracy stuff. I'm talking about, um, you know, I'm, I'm anti-woke or I'm anti-vax or I'm, I'm just, I'm just the anti-everything, right? You know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it sells, but they feel accepted. They feel included. And wherever mm-hmm. they were at before, pushed them out. They didn't include yeah. them anymore. And, and I don't say outcasts, but they, so I just think they've been hurt. And so when they, when they find a community of people that accept them, um, not really for who they are per se, but for saying things that, you know, people like that want to hear or, or, or just kind of being contrarian, people really enjoy the, the rebel contrarian, Mm. blah, blah, blah kind of thing. And, and, and that that's effective and it works. And so when I see folks like this, my approach is, I, I just want to, I just want to listen. I just want to understand again, kind of like with, I'm not making a comparison, but just like with the Trump supporter or the January 6th folks yeah. or whatever, I just want to understand, you know? So, so you're saying like, you know, how, how do I have some of these people on my show? You know, look, I mean, I'll just say how I do it on, on my podcast. Um, I've had a few, uh, controversial or potentially controversial people on my show. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me personally, you know, I, I, I want to, I, I try to get people that are experts or they're well, you know, researched or, or well-written or they, you know, they've really contributed. And even if I disagree, I don't give a shit. I want to, I just want to understand and I yeah. want to try as best as possible to understand the best version of themselves. So then everyone else can hear that yeah. because a lot of the times that this stuff becomes is everybody. And look, I, I get that impulse too. I, I hear it. People want to see the fight. They want to see the debate. Oh, you heard them what he said. Oh, and then he hit him with this. Oh, and then he fucked him up on this one. Oh, you caught him there. You know, people like that stuff. It's kind of this, you know, gladiator or you know whatever it's just that kind of part of us that's like yes i want to see a brawl or something like that and i get it i i get that but for me it's less of that and it's more of yeah that's cool but then it's like what does it leave you with right yeah. and so my thing is at least for me and how i do things is i want whoever's listening to say I got the most accurate, clearest uh, picture of what this person thinks. Yeah. And if, I, if, that, if a listener can walk away with that, I did my job. They could totally fucking hate the person. They could totally disagree with them. That's fine. That, that's totally fine. But I, I, at the end of the day, it's, but I understand what they think, though. I understand their beliefs. Yeah. And so for me, that's kind of my approach is to say how can i best get that out of them and you know maybe sometimes i do it well maybe sometimes i don't but i i think that that's always my aim and my goal so if if uh you know you want to have some of those folks or other people similar it would be to try and just understand hey yeah look man you, you say some wild shit you know or hey <laughs> you know I, I, i've seen a progression here w- w- tell me about that experience. Like, how did you get from here to here? And yeah, but you understand that this and this and this, you know, do do, do you hear how this is kind of received? Or I I think it's kind of like that. And and it's a way of, okay, well, you're saying all of these things, but um, you're, you're, it seems like there's some holes here or what am I missing here? Am I understanding this exactly? It's it's really a a trying to understand. And Mm -hmm. I think if you do that understanding, you know, you can then say, listen, I disagree and here's why, or, you know, whatever, push back or whatever. That's fine. But I think if you predominantly try to understand the person, you know, they're not, they're going to put their guards down. They're going to take their knives they have out. 
because they're used to that, right? That's what they're expecting, mm-hmm. right? Oh, this person's going to come at me and they're going to come out and I got to have my shields up and you're like, you can't, you know, whatever. And then it's going to be the whole like counter punch the whole time. And I think if you just like take that out, it's like, oh, oh, this person isn't going to like hit me for saying blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay. Well, wow. This person's like really curious about what I think when my idea is like legitimately. Oh, okay. You kind of lower the temperature. You get hopefully the best version of what they're saying. And then you can maybe kind of give some of the like, you know, look, I, I disagree with you. And, you know, here's some of the things why. But um, I understand where you're coming from, I think. You've told me that I got it accurate. And then you can have some kind of productivity after that. But that's just kind of how I do it. So I don't, I don't know if there's yeah. some of that that you do or. or... Yeah, no, you're, you're so much you're so much more chill than me. It makes me sound like a lunatic. But that's that's what that's what I try. That's what I try to do. Like, for example, like, uh, you know, uh, like I recently had Charles Love on. There's plenty that we disagree on. I had Benjamin Boyce on. Right. I, I, I know Charles. I know Charles. Yeah, 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 we're Charles friendly. Great, Charles. Right? Uh, Charles is, he's Boyce. a very nice person. Yeah. Just such a wonderful person to talk to. And, you know, I've had him on as well. And, and, and I disagree with him on a lot of things, but he's, he's to me a a really good faith person. Yeah. And I understand, I think his motives, I don't agree with all of them, but I I think he, I, I can, the thing I can say about Charles that I think is one of the best things about him is he absolutely fucking cares about kids and exactly. education yeah. and getting that. I understand that 110% and I will defend him on that point to the end. You can disagree with him and everything else. Uh, that's fine. But that's what's motivating him. Yeah. That's the passion. That's the drive. Now, how he, you know, uh, his, some of his beliefs or how he goes about it sometimes is, you know, I, I, I disagree. But I get that. Yeah. And that's that. I understand that. And so I can, I can meet him there. And yeah. I said, okay, okay, look, look, Charles, you and I are on this same page on this, man. What about this? Maybe, maybe we could do it. Maybe, maybe this way. And, you know, you might say, you know, go pound sand, but at least there's a way where we can connect somewhere with, I understand his motive. And I yeah. also, you know, have, you know, some passion about that too. Okay. You know, that's a, that's a good yeah. starting point. Yeah. A book that's currently in my ro- rotation is Roy Baumeister's uh, book on evil, right? And he talks yeah, about yeah, the myth yeah, of pure yeah. evil. And yeah. I always try to just remember this stuff because most people, are are good like evil is just this thing that we like to do for like black and white thinking and stuff but you know for i think charles is a great example or you know uh you and i like we've both had people like uh carol hooven on we both had uh uh big uh, shout out to carol carol is the most wonderful human being on the planet she's absolutely lovely love her i I tell the story about how like we were having scheduling conflicts and she called me and she was so apologetic (laughs) oh she's she's such a good person and i read her book And, and then there's Paige Harden, right, with the genetic lottery. And Paige I hate great. seeing Paige is I great. hate seeing some of these people get shit because I'm like, this is a good person, right? This is a good person trying mm-hmm. to do research or they care about, you know, whatever it is. And I hate seeing them get labeled and attacked and all of that. And as you're talking, because I, I do the same thing. Like, I want to see where someone's coming from, right? Like, when I had Benjamin Boyce on, I'm like, help me understand, you know, and obviously his experience being at Evergreen, that certain. But I called him out. I'm like, hey, do you see some of the stuff that you're doing on on Twitter might be fan in the flames. And, you know, I, I, I struggle with, uh, you know, following James Lindsay. I like to keep an eye on him, but I'm just like, I look at him. I'm like, you mother. Right. But here's, here's where I get, I get torn. I think, because I'm all for having people on and trying to understand where are you coming from? Why do you believe what you believe? You know, the epistemology, all that stuff. Right. And I, I want to understand other people, but here's, here's where I struggle is, if you if you believe uh, you know taking different routes with how we pass bills and you know if you're against Medicare for all or anti-abortion these are all things right but when your when your level of pandering gets to fanning the 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 co- like COVID conspiracies anti-vax narratives right like I look at what Fox News does and I find it despicable knowing how many of these people are vaxxed and they're fanning this right but like you said and this is one of the reasons I asked you to come on and everybody needs to go listen to your conversation with Vatya like I understand that loneliness right because that's part of what led to my downfall in YouTube I was getting attention and all this stuff and it kind of made me lose sight of my original goal of what I was trying to do so when I see these people doing it i understand but at what point at what point do we say listen now you've gone too far right like if you're if you're if you're promoting 
conspiracies about election fraud or about uh, vaccine, uh, you know, vaccines causing you to be magnetic and, you know, it can lead to actual real world harm. If you were, you know, if you were really promoting the ideas of what led to January 6th, that's where I have a problem because I'm like, now I see what you're doing, or even if we just go to Twitter, right? When I think about somebody like James Lindsay and you go through and it's just, you have X amount of talking points, you, you, you shove them out there and you say, your kids are gonna die if we even teach people about racism or whatever it is, right? I'm like, you might be leading to real world harm. That's where I have an issue. I'll, I'll sit there and I'll be compassionate and say, hey, you might be hurting. Like I look at James Lindsay, I'm like, are things rough in your life, right? Like, is, you know, do you have problems like in your real life? Is this why you do this? You, you, you go on Twitter and you get this attention and stuff. I always try to do that. But, but there comes a point where if it's leading to real world harm, that's, that's where I get conflicted. And it's, it's, it's like, I want to understand, right? Like I'll have, I've worked with plenty of drug addicts who have lied, cheat, stolen from their mother, right? Hell, I'm a drug addict who spent money on drugs instead of my son. And I, I've done plenty of reprehensible things, right? So I get it. And I get that there needs to be this level of understanding. But when you're in good conscience, like when you're in, when you are aware, right? When you're not being affected by drugs, hey, some James Lindsay might be high as fuck. I don't know, right? But if, if you're doing something that could potentially lead to real world harm, that like where do you see that do you see that as an issue or do you still just want to understand what's leading them to that or at a certain point you say hey you got to cut that shit out like this is just not cool you know yeah look i mean i'm not saying that because i understand somebody's position that <laughs> they get a pass for what they do or their actions or or that i'm you know agreeing with it i think that People are going to do have certain actions, and they have to be responsible for them, or they're or they're not. Right? Um, I think that's definitely the case. Um, I think that you know, in some ways, Twitter isn't real. Uh, it's not a real place, and in other ways, it is. Um, I mm. I I do have um, some some uh, energy and passion for people that are causing harm um, mm -hmm. inadvertently or otherwise um, I, I people disagree with me on this but I think that we have to be responsible for the harm that we cause and um, directly or indirectly you know if I, if I cause somebody harm and, and it's indirect I'm still going to have some ownership hey man mm -hmm. I'm sorry like whoa I didn't mean to do that um, I didn't even recognize it um, let, let me let me try and be more mindful um, but not everyone's going to do that. And I think it's because people have, they have different attitudes towards, you know, Twitter or online. And, you know, I, I think that people become not always, but sometimes people become the stuff they hate, you know, uh, what, what fights ideology? another ideology that's usually how it works mm -hmm. not always but you need another type of intensity another type of activism another type of ideology and um that's what a lot of these folks are doing um i, I do think again the most charitable reading of people that are you know anti-vax or um you know uh, have have some conspiratorial thinking about uh, you know COVID nineteen and the election and things like that is they're frustrated and upset and they're lashing out they're acting out you know against the system and look the system fucking sucks most days it, <laughs> yeah. it it doesn't help us most days and it's frustrating and I think when there's you know th those people this is the this is just, it's it's funny right it, and not actually funny but it's just ironic how many of the folks that are talking about i'm not gonna get you're not gonna mandate a shot to be put in my arm or you're not gonna tell me that i can't that the election wasn't stolen or that the system isn't working against us or taking my rights or taking my liberties that's literally the same argument that the woke make about marginalized communities yeah. now some of that has 
uh, actual valid truths to it, right, that we have evidence for, and some of it's exaggerated. I mean, I'll come out and say that. I mean, I think some of it is exaggerated. Uh, I don't, Or I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think it's just for everything, everyone, all the time. You know, all black people, all Latin people feel and have this yeah. experience. Like, no, that doesn't happen. So I think you see it, right, at the fringes where people feel um, – wronged by a system and they have different ways of acting out against it and i do think that there is a difference with um uh you know i think uh, many educational institutions i think many media institutions heavily lean heavily swing pretty left and i don't think that it's right that the right doesn't have you know, their own version of that. Um, they do feel shortchanged a lot. And I don't, I, I think people need to have the right to say what they want and, you know, express their opinions and beliefs. But when you have 90% of, you know, <laughs> educational ed institutions and 90% of the media is, you know, swung one way and they're just kind of, you know, talking down to many other people, you know, they're going to lash out. They're just going to, they're going to get outraged. I don't think that's right. I don't think they should do that, but you know, I, I understand. So I think that there's this, this is a big thing for me. This is a kind of centrist thing of sorts. And this is what makes me unpopular on <laughs> all ends. You know, the way that progress happens in my mind is pragmatic institutionalism, right? How do we use institutions to create laws, to create change? It's very slow, but that's the way it works. Because you can't have a country of 300 and almost 50 million people and expect change like that and that everyone's going to agree if you're in a democratic state. I think there's a reason why you have, uh, I think it's China, India, US, and then Indonesia is after us. I mean, China is a communist state. Uh, India is a very complicated hierarchical state mm -hmm. but they're able to manage mass amounts of people they, they, they can't have full dem, uh, democracies in places like that it wouldn't mm -hmm. work no one would ever get anything yeah. done you can't manage 1.4 billion people by everyone you know okay that's their country that's their they have a different history whatever whatever in this country we have you know close 350 million people democracy is going to be extremely slow and difficult because there's 350 million people over the third or fourth largest country in the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what do you expect? And it, it cannot be one way or, you know, or the other. I, I think it, it's going to be slow. You use institutions to get pragmatic change where somebody's getting something. Someone's getting the slice of the pie. Um, and progressives don't like that. Uh, right wing Republicans don't like that. You know, and um, centrists love it because it's like, look, that's how that works. That's you have to use institutions. And so I think when you have these, you know, culture war stuff and you have, you know, activists, there's a place for activism. But when you have these very strong ideological positions on both sides of things, it really just becomes a lot of hot air. And it distracts us from really talking about things that impact everybody. Yeah. And that's that's what's frustrating and i think most americans feel that way they're like look there's a place for culture war stuff but like you know I, I don't i don't think look you can make claims one way or the other about you know critical race theory being taught in schools or or fill in the blank right that's just what's in vogue now you know if you go back to the early 90s it was something else if you yeah. go back to you know whatever <laughs> at the end of the day there's always going to be the basic stuff right Education, jobs, healthcare, um, you know, a, a better criminal system uh, or justice system, rather. Um, you know, how do we have trade, good foreign affairs, et cetera, immigration. Mm -hmm. Those are always going to be somewhere on the ballot. Those are always things that are always going to impact everybody. Black, white, Latin, mixed, Asian, in indigenous, whatever. Those are always the big ticket items. If we ever forget any one of those things as our kind of North star, you know, that per that party is going to lose. Yeah. And, and, and that, and, and we're, and, and really 
regardless of the party, when, when our country forgets about those things, someone else is going to fill it. China's filling it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in India's filling it. Uh, Japan, Korea, you know, they're filling that, that void, you know, yeah. and international uh, globally. And, you know, we're going to sit over here, you know, arguing about, is it really critical race theory? That's not what that actually <laughs> yeah. means. That's not what's really being taught. And like, absolutely. They're coming for your kids. It's like, guys, I get it. There's some element of that that you want to talk about, but like, it's in my view, not that important. And I have had people yell at me you know, tell me this is the number one thing. Yeah. If it's not this, this is going to be the end of us. And if you don't get on board, you're going to see you're, are you listening yet? You're going to see blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to see meantime, people are overdosing on opioids. Meantime, we, we people can't get uh, prescription drugs that are, mm -hmm. are affordable. Meantime, uh, people are, you know, 4 million people just went out of the workforce last month. People don't have jobs. Meantime, inflation's high on and on and on and on with big things that affect everyone of every race yeah. and really of every class, except for the very top percent. So, I mean, I want to worry about that stuff, not what was Loudoun County parents talking about in their education system at the school board meeting. Like, fine, like that, yeah. let them do it. Yeah. Or, oh, God, did you see what Antifa was doing in Oregon? I was like, sure. Oh, let, I don't live there. Like, that's yeah. them. That's for them to figure out. Yeah. So I think we there's this, there's all of this stuff and people have kind of missed the plot. And I will, I will, this last thing I'll say right on this is I will, I will um, slightly beat up Biden on this. Um <laughs> You know, him going with the whole unity thing was very nice for a campaign. <laughs> um, and again, I mean, he's not a progressive. I mean, he's, you know, yeah. he's, he's super old. That's fine. But he really hasn't done anything in terms of his rhetoric, uh, in terms of any speeches, in terms of anything in trying to reach people. Look, I mean, I think his uh, policies and the bills that he's been doing are impacting many of those people, but he is not selling it that way. So they don't know that it's happening. Yeah, and yeah. that's Democrats always the biggest issue. But I think that that's, that's a problem because in terms of leadership, you need someone to say, Hey guys, let, let's stay focused on the real thing here. Right? Like, that's fine. We can have some of these debates and stuff, but, Let's stay focused, yeah. right? And and I think kind of, you know, this sideline, you know, subplot of doing some of this kind of wokey stuff is not helpful. I mean, I would be maybe okay with it if he was also doing some other stuff for some of the things that people on the right are, are upset about. But we don't get that. We get, you know, a lot of concessions giving to his base and throwing them a little red meat. And I don't know how helpful that is. And so... You know, I would rather someone, I mean, the best presidents are always centrist in my view. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, JFK was, LBJ definitely was, uh, Nixon really was for, for a little bit, at least first term. Um, Carter was, um, uh, uh, you know, HW Bush was, Clinton was, Obama was. So, I mean, you know, that's usually how it works. There's a few that are maybe a little bit more trending for one way or the other, but, and that's what we need. And so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, you were, you were right. Like, we were talking about how long we would do this. And, and we have to talk about the University of Austin. But first, I, I do want to touch on something real quick with what sure, you were yeah. saying, too. Like, yeah, 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 please. Um, but, but yeah, like, so the way I see it, you know, um, like going back, like something I've been a, a, on a kick about, you know, in my writing lately, and I've just been thinking about it a lot is, Here's where I'm at, like, you know, going back to the conversation about, you know, these figures who are fanning the flames of polarization and all that kind of stuff. Like, here's, here's what I've been writing about a lot lately. I am so, I am, I'm tired of waiting for like policy and institutional changes, right? Like I, I, I 1000% believe we need these changes, but today we could be taking actions on a personal level right because you have the politicians you have all these people but 
think about the world that we live in in 2021, right? There are people on on Twitter, and it's not just Twitter either. We're talking about mm-hmm. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you know, whatever, who have mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of followers. These are the people, these are the people who are perpetuating the polarization, right? Mm-hmm. And I look at that and I'm like, we need to start here. But the issue that I see is this, you know, uh, and I and I won't get into the whole like economical debate about it, but mm-hmm. I always see capitalism as the major problem, right? Because everything we have, the North Star for every single person in the United States, right? Like you're you're familiar, like uh, you know, in in Asian countries, they're more collectivist, right? Here, a little bit more individualist, right? But everybody's North Star is money, status, power, right? So how the hell, how the hell do we ever expect somebody like, uh, you know, anybody from the woke or from the anti woke to ever stop fanning the flames of tribalism when everything incentivizes them mm-hmm. to go for the attention? the money, Mm -hmm. the power, the status, so they can have their nice house, their nice car, da-da-da-da-da, all these other things, right? And yes, we do need to change systems and institutions. We need policies like we're talking like, we need we need healthcare, we need mental health care and all these other things, but Mm -hmm. I don't see anybody caring about this stuff until these people, for lack of better words, chill the fuck out, right? (laughs) And I I hate it. Like I wrote a piece yesterday about uh Badia and some of the promotions she's been getting because Badia is a fucking angel right yeah, she's, she's great she's, she's lovely she's, she's bringing it so incredible she's bringing attention to you know how media has shifted to this college mm-hmm. elite level stuff which then spiraled into this kind of woke media and I see I, what I wrote about is I see the anti-woke just as bad as the woke and completely missing mm-hmm the point of what Batya is talking about. And the mm-hmm. point being is that the culture war bullshit is making us forget about all of the real world stuff like yeah. prescription drugs, suicide rates, loneliness, yeah, which yeah. leads to addiction, right? Uh, I don't know if you read uh, Deaths of Despair yet, but it talks a lot about that and how people are miserable. But the anti-woke sharing Batya's stuff are just as bad because they're mm-hmm. distracting from the real problem but then when i go down to the root layer of that they're incentivized by it they're incentivized yeah. Yeah, yeah. by the popularity so anyways if you want to touch on that for a minute like i have, s- I have two quick responses to it um yeah. the first thing is there's two things uh, the first thing is people need to um not they people i mean really it's the responsibility of each person you have to really have you know, social media and media in general, I think is like the biggest exercise in self-control and we, (laughs) we are terrible at that. Um, and, um, I think people need to not give into it. Don't, don't, don't click on the like, don't view it. Yeah. Don't give your hot take. Don't, don't do it. You don't need to do it. Think three steps ahead. I'm going to say this, this is going to happen. This is going to be gone in two days. No one's going to care about it. Do I really need to say this and contribute? No. Let it go. Let it go. I mean, it is by choice that if you look at my Twitter feed, um, I don't have takes on most of the stuff that comes up. And that is uh, volitional. I, 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 I don't do it. It's not necessary. Yeah. No one's going to be thinking about it. If you were to ask someone what was going on three weeks ago, no one could tell you. No <laughs> right. one could tell you. But it was at the time, everyone was so outraged until the next thing. We got to stop that. The way you stop it is don't give into it. Don't don't feed into it. Um, the second thing is connect it. If you don't have other things going on in your life, then you're not going to have the space to do that. Or, or you will have the space to do that. So you have to have other things in your life that are in the real world that are productive, that you're doing something for yourself, your loved ones, your friends, your family, you're, you're, you're pushing yourself. You're trying to learn new things. Um, you're trying to experience things with people and you'll see very quickly, um, that, that, that stuff doesn't matter. I mean, a couple weekends ago, I, I, I did a kind of a friend's weekend thing. Um, you know, my wife and I, we went and with some of our, our friends and, you know, I, I, I don't think I picked up my phone more than twice, you know, mm-hmm. 
And it was great because it was just, you know, we were connecting with friends. It was a group of us and we were just catching up and talking and, and we didn't really talk about politics too much. We didn't really talk about like culture war stuff. It really was just everybody as people. Like what was going on? Because you know what happens when all that, every time when everybody has all that stuff, like there's people have hurts and they have pains mm -hmm. and someone's, you know, aunt or mom or whatever is dying of something. Someone just got laid off. Someone is having a hard time in school finishing something. And when we crowd our brain with all that fucking bullshit, that doesn't really <laughs> matter. You miss the person. And th that person that's sending that tweet, that's got a really good dunk. Th they have things that when they, when they put their phone down, they, they got they have they have something they have a problem they have to attend to they got yeah. something going on in their life and you don't know it and 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 look there's plenty of bots online that's fine but for people that are real people there you know it's it's that and so I think if we have if we have if we, we we have our, our fill our time um uh with things that are productive there's less and less desire to want to have the like response to everything that happens and and, I, and I'll just say, you know, this is how I see it. Maybe not everybody sees it this way. Um, I always have this fear that I don't have enough time here on earth, right? That's not some mm -hmm. weird, vague, suicidal thing, guys. But it's, <laughs> it's a, it's, time is short, you know? Yeah. Life is short. And, 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 you know, how do we really make the most of each moment, each day? And if, if you sit down and you think, how much time did I spend dunking on people, having my hot takes on the trial going on right now and the Chappelle thing and Afghanistan pull out. It's like, sure. I mean, granted people can do what they want, but like think about all the time that you've spent yeah. negatively spewing all of your bullshit from stream of conscious that you don't think about ever again when you could be doing something else more productive. Isn't that a better way? And it's really having the self-control and the wherewithal to do that and to also say, do I have other things in my life that are, you know, productively filling my time in really, really fulfilling ways? And I think yeah. when I see people online that do that, um, that's usually where I think they don't have enough going on in their life and they don't really have as much self-control. Yeah. And and um and they, they like the dopamine hit and all that good stuff. And look, yeah. I mean, we all do that. Some everyone's susceptible to that, but I mean, well, I, I know about those good dopamine hits. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> we all, we're all susceptible to it myself yeah. included, but we have to try. Yeah, no. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that I try to do with my writing and why I call, I call everybody out left, right, whatever I do it. I, I write about it because I, you know, I think about it like, yes, I think that the people and, you know, when we get into this university of Austin discussion, the people at the top, they're fueling this stuff, right? But the we're incentivizing them. We're we're feeding that monster, yeah. right? Every single yeah. like, every single retweet. The, every they're not doing retweet. that stuff if they're not gonna yeah. get look, look, you know this, right? You've you've had a YouTube channel, you have the podcast, I have a podcast. I know what's gonna I know which episodes are gonna get me the most downloads. I can tell you right now which episodes. I don't even have to look at it. I know which ones have the most downloads. I know yeah. it. The ones on race, the ones on gender. That's it. I know that. I know. I, I don't have to look at it. You know, the ones that have the really good title and the, you know, kind of tagline and, you know, whatever. I mean, I get it. I understand it. But like we, we have to fight against that and say, no, this is important. You know what? I want to, I want to look at that, uh, that, you know, Pew Research article or, or the Brookings Institute put out this report about, you know whatever it is, you know, opioid addiction or, you know, a wildlife re refuge that, you know, whatever, whatever, like whatever you're interested in, whatever you're passionate about, that's what needs attention. And, yeah. and I think that if you just do that and you try and promote that, you know, people will eventually catch on and, and, and you, you can get people that are really engaged with that stuff. And, yeah. you know, but it's hard though. It is, it yeah. is hard. Yeah, like that, like part of my strategy, I, I, I do Twitter a little bit differently, but I try to, uh, you know, aside from my, you know, takes and opinions on things and my content that I make, I try to like, be like, hey, look at this new Lego I got, or hey, I'm watching this yeah. with my son, you know? Hey, yeah, so, you're a real person in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that that's kind of my strategy for anybody who's listening, like that's what I, I try to do, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, just uh, societal issues, they're, they're something I, I care about immensely, but I'm also a real person, just like you and me, and I, mm -hmm. I wish mm -hmm. more, more people would do that, but 
but but you know uh this does transition well into the university of austin thing because i'll give you my take on it and i would love your your opinion because i'm a college dropout so you're obviously way more academic than me but anyways uh so university of austin people you know should hopefully know about it but if not barry weiss made this big announcement and i feel like uh, i've been critical of barry weiss because i feel like she's leaned really into you know a certain niche right of free speech and all these other things and i think I think she's, uh, you know, she's more dynamic than that. But anyways, she brings on a lot of these guests, Peter Bogosian, uh, you know, Kathleen Stock, uh, Julie Bendel, people who talk about the main culture war issues, race, that, 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 uh, you know, um, gender and all that stuff, right? Okay, cool. So I do see, I do believe, you know, we've seen it, uh, I, you know, like many others, I read The Coddling of the American Mind, that there are some issues on college campuses where people feel that they can't say or teach and all these other things. I've talked to a lot of professors and stuff like that. And I'm always like, how big of an issue is it? That I still don't know for certain. But anyways, they started the University of Austin to be this kind of place of free thought, free speech, and all these other things. And me, so me, where I land, you know, because of all the people who have joined on, like uh, all the people I listed, like Peter Bogosian and Steven Pinker, I'll mention that in a second, but all these people, right, they're the outcasts, right? They're the, they're the ones from like the intellectual dark web and the people who they talk about those controversial things that they brought them on board. Here's why I'm on the fence, right? I'm, I'm, I'm anybody's biggest cheerleader if they want to start a project. If they do, I'm like, fuck yeah, you go. Like we were just talking about, <laughs> like everybody needs things outside of the internet. So if you right. want to go through the, the the act of starting a university or whatever, fucking cool. That sounds like a fun little project for you to do, mm -hmm. which, you know, you, you believe is very important, right? But, you know, the reason I'm I'm on the fence about it, because even if it's somewhat needed, right? Even if they believe it's somewhat needed, I my concern would be, that they would be just as bad as what they're fighting against, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. here, like uh, I'm always trying to think of both both sides, right? And each other's worst enemies, right? So when I think of the University of Austin and the people they've gotten on board and if they're really about free speech and sharing ideas and everything like that, the true test of that would be is that you need to sign on some of the wokest fucking professors that I could even imagine, right? <laughs> like I, I want, I want a professor there who has a course on how gender isn't real, how race isn't, you know what I mean? So, so people do have that full spectrum because unless you're doing that, no, no, you're not, you're not for free speech and sharing ideas and all that. So for me, I, I'm like, you know, is it, is it just an attention grab? Because that's what I get concerned about, right? Um, and recently uh i think it was just yesterday steven pinker and somebody else they jumped ship they said it's because they have other uh you know projects steven pinker has his new book he has a new show coming out personally my opinion on it which i have no evidence for is i think that's bullshit you know like he he's known like he's a he's known about his book for how long he's known about his upcoming show. Like, I'm pretty sure, I've never met Steven Pinker, but I'm pretty sure he has like a calendar and organizes his time pretty well. So it's not like, oops, I have these other commitments that just popped mm -hmm. up. So I'm a little skeptical of that. But anyways, that's kind of where I stand on the University of Austin. Um, I don't, like, I don't see it being this huge make or break thing. It's one of those like small topics, but mm -hmm. I would love to know your thoughts on it. Yeah, so I, I was uh, I was trying to to pull up the uh, the actual um, like a uh, mission statement. Yeah, the the actual thing that they had that they that kind of their mission statement. Okay, here it is. Um, I mean, there you can people can look this up, but uh, and so I won't read all of it. But I, I think one of it was the big thing is building a university dedicated to the fearless. Uh, pursuit of truth um, and then they have all these things about their principles so universities uh, devoted to the unfettered pursuit of truth at a cornerstone of a free and flourishing democratic society for universities to serve their purpose they must be fully committed to freedom of inquiry freedom of conscience and civil discourse in order to maintain these principles University of Austin uh, will be fiercely independent financially intellectually and politically that's kind of like their principles mission yeah. statement. So look, I mean, you know, if you read any of these institutions, they all have some kind of boilerplate language like that. I mean, that, that's not anything out of the ordinary. 
um, so I haven't, so this is kind of going to my example. So I saw this happen last week, I guess it was, I saw Barry's post and, um, I said, oh, that's interesting. And so I saw kind of the, uh, all the, the list of names, the, uh, the, the Avengers, if you will, of, of the <laughs> anti-woke that were the, all the, all the big guys and girls that were, were part of it. Um, and I, and I like some of those folks, um, I didn't say anything on it because I just kind of wanted to wait and see. Um, and I saw the expected. I mean, this stuff is really, really yeah. uh, um, predictable. What's it called? predictable at this point. <laughs> but, um, you know, there was the pile on, you know, was, you know, everyone was like, you know, just trashing them. And I didn't say anything publicly. I didn't think I needed to. I was like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. Um, I kept seeing some things over the past couple of days, and then um, I kind of was started formulating my own opinion about it based on what was there, and and then yeah, there's um, at least uh, three people that have pulled from the board, which is uh, uh, G Zimmer and um, Pinker mm-hmm. uh, have 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 pulled away from the the board of the uh, university for various reasons. Um, I think Zimmer was a little bit more pointed. I think he said that he had ideological differences mm. and wasn't completely on board with the direction they were going. Uh, yeah, Pinker said that he had um, other engagements. Um, so, and um, and I don't, I'm not sure about uh, the other guy. But so, you know, I mean, it, it's not a good start for them for sure. I mean, you have three people within a week pull out, you know, yeah. and it's kind of some big names. Um. So I'll give my I'll give my charitable view on this <laughs> first. Um, so look, the thing I dislike the most is people that kind of bitch and moan about like, you know, just railing on, you know, oh my God, there's all these problems with you know education. There's all these problems with our institutions. Ah, you know, there's all these problems, all these problems, all these problems. Yep, for sure. <clears throat> and then people don't do anything about it. They just kind of like, <laughs> just it's yeah, kind of like a broken broke. record. They just go over and over and over and over and over. And you know, I've done some of that too. Yeah. Um, so I really applaud their uh, attempt at trying to do something. Right? It is extremely hard to start a university from scratch. You know, it's not an online university. I mean, it's like a legit like buildings and the whole thing. Um. So, you know, and they got um. You know, they got some big names. Um, I think they, I mean, before some of the folks pulled out from the board, you know, they had some people that were in kind of the administration side of things, right? Yeah. This wasn't just a couple of, you know, Substack reporters, right? And there's a lot of those, but um, there's, you know, they got people from the president, I think was at St. John's College, which is a great liberal arts mm-hmm. school. And um, they had, they did have the guy at, from University of Chicago, um, et cetera. So I think that that's good. You know, you need some some good people that you know know how to run administrations. Um, you need some uh, people that are um, at the top and then middle management of how they do it. You know, you want some people that are good on the board, and then you want some really you know good names that are um, going to teach and you know professors or instructors, whatever they're going to call them. Um, so, you know, I, I really applaud that they're trying to do something right They're They're, they're all complaining about education in the, in the United States <laughs> yeah. and that's good. That's good. You know, they're trying to do it, you know, instead of just like railing against it. Um, so I really do applaud that. I do. Um, it's not how I would do it. My, my thing here is I'm fine with people wanting to start new institutions. Um, that's fine. This really feels as a reaction to what's going on in our universities, Mm. right? This doesn't feel like it's its own thing. Like, Hey, we have a, we have a, we have a group of people that we want to get together and we want to do this kind of educational institution full stop. Yeah. It is very implicit with, or even explicit here is the problem in universities today. It's being run over by anti-woke, or excuse me, by woke, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, very liberal bias. 
we have a free speech crisis, blah, 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 blah. I'm not disagreeing with any mm-hmm. of those pieces. We do have problems in our universities. We do have problems with free speech. We do have problems with quality education in classrooms. That's mm-hmm. one of the biggest things there. Those are all huge problems in private, public, state-run uh, universities, you know, uh, community colleges, online. It just it is a big problem. Okay, but I, I guess the thing about it that really bothers me is that it feels reactionary. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we're going to do the opposite of this. Right. So the second thing is the point that you brought up. Okay. What was it? You know, free speech and inquiry and what was it? Pursuit of truth and conscience and civil discourse, fiercely independent intellectually and politically. Great. Okay. I fully expect you to get some folks that are teaching critical race theory, gender yeah. studies, um, you know, all that, all that stuff. I, I, I fully expect that. And what I saw was a lot of people that are <clears throat> liberals turned, you know, kind of center right folks. Yeah. And that's fine. That's, that's fine. Um, but I saw a lot of things that were kind of reactionary and it didn't seem balanced. I mean, you know, and, and, and that's the thing, right? This is the thing. This is the problem with parties. You know, people will say <laughs> half to three fourths of those people that were announced will say, I'm a liberal. And look, I think in theory, they probably are. Yeah. Um, but no liberal or no one on the left would consider them part of their group anymore. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. So then it becomes this whole like, weird argument about like well i'm more liberal than you are blah 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 kind of thing and that's a weird thing to argue about um i know what real liberalism is you know and it's just like okay what are we doing here (laughs) so yeah i worry about the whole like diversity of like thought really right is this going to be just how to fight the woke kind of shit (laughs) is this going to be you know, here's, you know, we're just going to read John Stuart Mill, you know, over and over and over on free speech and, you know, whatever, um, you know, or, or is it really going to be it, it now? It might be, it, it might be, I could be wrong. It might be. Yeah. And so, um, I think that was my biggest thing. And, and again, I don't, I don't want a university of anti-woke, right? If, if you're going to do something right. So, so then my third point is. And now maybe some people have tried to do this. Now I could be wrong on this. I, I'm not inside this stuff. I don't know. But my another criticism is this feels ideological. This feels exactly the opposite of what you're going against. Yeah. And it might have really good intentions. And I can really see that. Like, I, I mean, I just, before I said any of my criticisms, I just said, I really appreciate the intention, the motive for doing it, trying to be active about it. But it feels pretty ideological in some ways. And um, what's the end point? So you're going to have one university. Now, granted, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be too harsh. I mean, they got to get started or whatever, but you're going to have one, one university in Austin. Okay. And you're going to attract a lot of, a lot of people are going to be into it. Okay. There's going to be a lot of certain types of people that are going to be into it. But what about all the other institutions? So yeah. we just, we just don't, we don't do anything with them. We just like, they're a lost cause. That's it. You know, we don't, we don't do any reform. And, yeah. and th- this is the thing. This is the thing. This is the thing that really gets, gets me going is if you really like the, the ideas and the principles of many of our institutions, right? Our country was founded, um, on many certain principles our country's founding and our founders are flawed human beings and they had a flawed system they did not figure it all out Mm -hmm. fine that's fine but there are many good things about this country there are many things about what it is to to be proud to be in this country um and many of our institutions are are fantastic they're imperfect they need um continuous they're they're living right they they yeah. need to always be you know updated and and reformed but 
we don't get so much of the great stuff we did. Um, we did a lot of horrible things too, for sure. But we did a lot of really awesome things in the 20th century, you know, mm. and, and <clears throat> so much innovation, so much creation, so many awesome people, you know, why? Because, because of, for a certain period, there's, you know, there's a really strong ideological bent. So we're just going to say, fuck it. We just give up on 250 years or whatever it is <laughs> yeah. of institutions. Like, you know, fuck Harvard because, you know, it's a little woke right now. We're going to do a new university. I mean, again, that's fine if you want to do that. You can do a new university. But, but, th but these are people that are just like <clears throat> fed up. I'm tired of it. And there's no... I guess for me, again, I'm not in this, right? So, you know, people are like, oh, it's really easy for you to say, right? You're not in these places. You don't know. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. But shouldn't we try to, I, this is the, thing, the conversation I had with, with Batia. Like, I don't think having the future of journalism be on Substack. Like, there's nothing wrong with Substack. That's fine. That's not where the future of journalism is. We we need institutions. And yeah. and both sides of these of, of these folks Make the same arguments. It's it's the right, yeah, that's saying we don't need Department of Energy. We don't need Department of Education. We don't need the, the Federal Reserve. We don't need any of that. We don't need institutions. We don't need government telling us what to do. But you have other people on the left or formerly on the left saying, well, fuck it. We're not going to use any of the institutions either. And it's just like, it's this weird thing where it's yeah. like <laughs> this, like, <laughs> it's this, like, you know, um, dissociating from like, the people in the institution, it's like, no, it's, it's, it's slow. It's hard, but it's where you're active in trying to change institutions. You know, just as a reminder, right? You can say all the things you want and how flawed he was X, Y, and Z. Do you know how we passed the voting rights act, the fair housing act, the civil rights act, Medicaid, Medicare, were the New the Deal. Nixon, were these the Nixon things? The, these or are all LBJ things. LBJ things. We did that through what? The House, the Senate, yeah, the 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 executive branch. We did it through activism. We needed activism, but it was all of those things. It wasn't fuck it. We're just not going to do it anymore. Uh, we're we're just going to find another alternative to doing this, yeah. right? We've done that with everything. How did we get idea? right? The Disabilities Act. How did we get gay marriage to be legal in this country? We used institutions. Yeah. They are flawed. They need to be fixed for sure. But you don't give up on it, right? You don't just go and start a new thing because, oh, well, we're tired of trying. We're tired. That's not how you, that's, that's how you, you go to ruin. Because if you don't have institutions to kind of coalesce things together, everyone's going to be doing their own thing. Yeah. Which, which again, even though I'm center left, you know, I will always say, I believe and I, and I back it up with how I vote and I back it up with what policies I really like. I believe in a strong centralized federal government, just like Hamilton and Washington wanted it. And Adams is that's how, that's how I think we need to have things and everything outside of that. We can have different states, right? we can have all these things, but we need that. And I think, because that's what you, you can't do those things to scale. How are you going to educate people if you don't have that? We have 330 million people in this country. It's a yeah. huge country. You can't have 50 people doing 50 states doing 50 things. You need something that's centralized. That's why the whole argument with Scandinavia never works for me. It's like, yeah, sure. There are 5 million people in Denmark or whatever <laughs> it is. Like, okay. And they're all homogenized. Like, that, nothing wrong with that. But it's easier to scale. So how, how – I don't understand. I don't understand what's the end game here. You're going to have a one-off university that's going to attract certain types of folks. I would be floored if they taught something balanced, right? Yeah. And, <clears throat> okay. Um, and I already can hear the counter. Well, we can't get anybody that wants to teach that. So I guess we won't. We're just going to teach. I, I can already hear the counters. This. Okay. It, it's the same thing with the people on the other side. You know, we, we don't need any of these institutions. We don't need any of this stuff, you know, and I don't, I'm not opposed to people starting new things. I'm not opposed to trying new stuff or creating new institutions. That's fine. But I don't want it to be something that's done in reaction to something. Yeah. Do it in a way where you've really thought about this. You know, would you have done this in 95? 
where there was none of this going on? Yeah. No, probably not. Yeah. Would you have done this in 2010? Probably not. Why are you doing it right now? Because you're tired. You, you, you're tired of having to deal with this. You don't want to do all this stuff. So you're using your name. You may be using you know, money. Maybe you're using clout. Maybe you're using some experience to say, we're going to do this. And look, it might be good, right? It might be good. I do applaud them for trying to do something, but uh, I'm less sanguine about yeah. You know, some of the ways in which their, their, their success may be. So again, you know, uh, you know, people can listen to this and be like, you know, oh, whatever, you know, you know, they can have their own opinions about it, but you know, I, I sat about it, I sat down and I thought about it and I said, Oh, you know, I've looked at it this way. I think there's some pros and cons to it, but probably on, on average, I, I think the intention's right. But I think, you know, I'm probably 70% like, eh, yeah, not really a fan. Yeah, you know, and you know, that's that's a great place to wrap this thing up because with this specifically, I think with your thoughts and my thoughts, only only time will tell. I'm hoping Of I'm course, hoping, yeah. I'm I could be totally they, wrong. They, they I could be totally out. wrong. Yeah, I'm hoping. Hey, I, I love being wrong about that stuff. It's like you go. So maybe we'll do a follow up after they like announce their curriculum, more of their staff sure. and everything. And maybe they have yeah. bigger ideas to spread this thing. I don't know. But but yeah, man, uh, congratulations. This is officially my longest episode. And I can honestly <laughs> oh, is probably it? go forever, but uh, <laughs> I need to eat. So for everybody <laughs> who just fell in love with the man who is Xavier, where, where can people find you and keep up to date with all your stuff and do you have anything in the pipeline that that we should keep an eye out for or is it just is it is it just the podcast that you're sticking with <laughs> for now it's just the podcast um i have a bunch of unfinished pieces that i'm writing and i can never you know i, I i'm so impatient with myself and i can never <laughs> just take the time to write and edit but i have a few things i've been working on and off but nothing really serious that i'm going to put out soon but Hopefully, hopefully this coming year I'll be able to 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 do a little bit more writing. Um, yes, uh, the best ways to find me is uh, I mean I'm on Twitter. I'm pretty easy to find, but also um, uh, the best place is the podcast. Um, I am pretty regular there. Uh, so the podcast is Converging Dialogues. Um, I do at least an episode a week. Uh, for now, it's it's been two. It's going to go back down to one in, in the coming year, uh, but it's for now it's two. Uh, lots of wonderful, awesome people. Um, and, uh, I, I greatly enjoy doing that. So I hope everyone, you know, subscribes and listens. Um, and yeah, it's on all platforms. Um, you can Google it. You'll find it. Um, if you see me on Twitter, you'll find it. You'll see all the you know, links and everything like that. So, um, that's probably the, the best place to find me. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do one, but I'm going to link all that stuff down in the description. So they don't got to Google a damn thing. But man, <laughs> That's great. This, That's great. This is great. And I, I think we'll definitely do this again. I'm going to get some more topics because I we could talk all day. But it, yeah, man, thanks Anytime, so man. much for coming on. Your East no, it's great. It's it it a great conversation. You're, you're very, very uh, easy to, to chat with and just nice flow. And um, yeah, I, I, I greatly enjoyed it. It's always it's always nice being on the other side of the of the microphone. So uh, I, I have no I have no post editing to do. So it's uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, all on my end. <laughs>